Test one. You will hear a number of different recordings, and you have to answer questions on what you hear. There'll be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played only once. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers into your answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one. You will hear a conversation between a student and a saleswoman. First, you have some time to look at questions one to ten. Now listen carefully and answer questions one to ten. Hello, my name is Garcia. I phoned earlier about finding accommodation. Ah, yes, Mr. Garcia. I took your call. Please take a seat. You said on the phone that you are studying at the university. That's right. I'm currently in University Digs, but I have decided to move out. May I ask why? Well, the accommodation itself is fine, very nice, in fact, but it's catered accommodation, and I find having to have my meals at fixed times somewhat restrictive. I tried to get into self-catering accommodation, but there's very little of that available, and as I will be a second-year student next academic year, I wasn't given a place. I see. We have many students coming to us who are in the same situation. Do you intend to live alone or share with someone? I have two friends from Spain and from Colombia, who would like to share with me. We thought it would be a good idea to rent a small house together. Does that sound sensible to you? Sure. In fact, I recommend it. Where are you from, Mr. Garcia? I'm from Mexico. Really? I went there on holiday last year. Lovely. So you're looking for a three-bedroom house? How about a flat? Would that be okay? Yes, that would be fine too. But if the rents are roughly the same, we'd prefer a house with a small garden, just somewhere where we can sit outside in the sunshine. Of course, we do have houses, but more flats are available at the moment. Is there any particular area you'd like to live in? Obviously, we'd like to be close to the university if possible, but not too close. My experience is that people living in the proximity of the uni tend to get a lot of people dropping in. We'd like to avoid that. I understand. Places further from the uni are also a little cheaper in general. Before we go on, could I take down a few details? Of course. My full name is Manuel Garcia. I currently live at thirty-five C Campus Lane. Thank you. And your telephone number and email address? My mobile number is o four five three six seven two three four eight. My email address is. Garcia, nuk at email dot uk. How old are you and your future housemates? I'm nineteen. My friends are nineteen and twenty. And are you all male? Yes. Smokers? No.、Nope. Okay. How much would you be prepared to pay altogether? We heard that two hundred to two hundred and fifty pounds a month would be possible. Yes, that's about right. Accommodation in this town is below the average for the country as a whole. I'd recommend something closer to two hundred and fifty pounds, since the lower-paid accommodation can be rather poor quality. Yes, it's important to feel good in a home. We intend to move in at the beginning of July. We've all got placements over the summer holiday. That's good. A lot of landlords will offer a small discount if they know that you'll be there throughout the year. I think we'll find something decent for around two hundred and thirty pounds a month. I should point out that utilities are not included. I understand. We expected that. By the way, we understand that you will charge us a fee for arranging accommodation. Is that correct? Yes, it is. We charge you half a month's rent and the landlord half a month's rent. That includes the cost of drawing up a rental agreement. All our landlords require a deposit of a month's rent. Payable with the first month's rent.
upon signing the agreement. That's fine. Now, I'll just write down the kind of place you're looking for. I don't think that'll be a problem. Do you have any other requirements? Uh, let me think for a minute. Oh, of course, how could I forget? It must be furnished. We don't mind buying kitchen utensils. A TV, yes, we'll need that. We don't need a video or DVD player. Oh, and a washing machine. That's essential. As is an internet connection. I presume all the accommodation you offer has a cooker. Yes, you don't have to worry about that. Do you prefer a bath or shower? Uh, we'd prefer to have a shower, but we're not fussy about that. Right then, I'll send you the details of three or four of the most suitable properties later, today by email. Then you can let me know whether you'd like to see any of the properties or whether you'd prefer to see details of some others. Thank you for dropping by, Mr Garcia. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You will hear a conversation between an interviewer and an interviewee. First you have some time to look at questions 11 to 20. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 20. What was your holiday location and how did you hear about it? My holiday location was Waiwara in New Zealand. It is a thermal spa resort. I was there last year with my parents, my sister and a couple of friends of my parents. My father and my little sister who inherited the medical problems from my father need to go to a thermal spa every year for treatment. They used to go to the Polynesian Spa in Rotorua, another famous resort in New Zealand. But last year they decided that they fancied a change. I had never gone with them to a spa because I preferred to spend my holiday at home or go to other places. But last year, when they changed the location, I decided to go with them. I also decided to go because my sister really wanted me to go with her. My parents found out about this location from some of the people they met in Rotorua. These people said that they were more satisfied with the accommodation and facilities at the Waiwara Spa. So my parents were curious, and when they returned home they asked me to search on the internet for some information. They were impressed with the information I found, and it was then that they decided to plan a trip there. So you went with your family and your parents' friends? Yes. I travelled with my parents, my little sister and some family friends with their three children, so that altogether we were nine people. I was lucky because in the other family there was a boy one year older than me, so I had someone to pass the time with and have some fun. There were a lot of elderly people and kids at the spa town, so I was happy that he was with me. We had similar interests. It's good to be with someone with your own age when you're on holiday. How much time did you spend finding out information about this spa? I didn't spend so much time searching for the information because the spa has website that was easy to find. We wanted some more information that wasn't on the website, particularly about how to get there. But we went to a travel agency and they gave us the information that we didn't have and made the reservations for all of us. Can you tell us the thing you like most at the spa? There were so many things that I liked there. I especially liked the accommodation. We stayed at the Waiwara Holiday Inn, which is situated right on the beach. It offers spectacular sea views. I think that I'll never forget it. Were there any things that you were not satisfied with? 
I think that the bad side of this vacation was that there were so many old people and many, many children. Luckily, there were some play areas for children, and they stayed there most of the time. How was your room? Did you have everything you needed? Yes, we had everything we needed. Everything was comfortable and the conditions were great, so I have nothing to complain about. Did you make any new friends? Are you still in touch? Everyone was very gentle and warm. They really made a good impression. When we needed some help, they were very helpful and I felt great. I'm still in touch with the son of my parents' friends. How did you spend your time? Did you participate in any recreational activities? I don't have any medical problems like my father and sister, but I still went to the thermal spa. There were a lot of recreational activities to enjoy if we wanted. For example, I played golf because there was a mini golf course. Basketball and volleyball were also available, but we couldn't get enough people together for two proper teams. I also went to swim and I also went scuba diving on the reef, not far from the hotel. There was a small group of us with an instructor. It was truly amazing. I cannot describe in words how I felt down there. It was like I was in paradise. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section three. Section three. You will hear a talk. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 30. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 30. So you have all told me that you have been having difficulties with taking part in seminar discussions. I've invited you here to see if we can come up with some suggestions and solutions. Sometimes talking about these things can be helpful. Mika, you said that you think speaking and listening abilities are related. Yes, it was really difficult because basically I, I wasn't good at listening during discussions. You know, you need to understand what is going on, so if you miss some things that people say, it's very difficult to catch up with the topic. Also, when the tutor asked me a question, sometimes I couldn't understand the question and I was answering by making a guess about what he was asking. Usually, the result was that he said something like, I think you didn't understand my question, which was quite embarrassing for me. Martina, have you personally had many difficulties taking part in discussions? Oh yes, definitely. Especially in the very beginning of the course. In terms of speaking, I think I feel that the students, when they talk in class, there is no end to the conversation. They sometimes talk continuously regardless of whether you raise a hand. However, they will usually stop and let you speak if you just interrupt someone. At the beginning, I think I was trying to adapt to this kind of environment or classroom chemistry. It was also difficult because of my language ability. At the beginning, students, especially native speaker students, well, their English is... Well, I don't need to comment about their English, but the speed and the fluency of their English made interaction or intervention, I mean interruption, very difficult for students like me, like us, non-native speakers. One thing I learnt to try and do is to think and try to anticipate where the discussion might go, so that when, for example, they talk about something, you know, like, when they talk about, for example, how children think, I can get some ideas in my mind and then I can join in. Before, by the time I had collected all my thoughts and was ready to join in, 
the discussion had moved on. So basically, I think it requires you to think quickly and think ahead if you want to join in. Mikhail, have you done anything to try and improve and to participate in such discussions? I think I have. For example, now I have more discussions with my classmates outside the classroom, and talk about them with some of the questions raised in the seminars. If you ask tutors about your concerns, they listen to you very carefully, and they pay attention to the issue in future seminars. They also try to, how do you say it in English,、uh, catch your eye and see if you are ready to make a comment. If you are. They interrupt the native speakers and what's the other idiom?、Uh, give you the floor. That's it. Tutors are very good at accommodating all the people in the room, but you have to let them know you want to speak. Eye contact and body language can be useful. Martina, with regards to speaking in discussions, what advice would you give to another student coming to study in England? Be polite when you discuss something or argue something. Don't be aggressive. Just be polite and argue in a polite way. And if you say something wrong, just admit it. English students don't mind if you make a mistake, and you should admit it and then continue the argument or discussion. If I have a really good idea or previous knowledge about the subject under discussion, my view is respected. But if I don't have anything to say about the topic, that's not good. So I advise the students from overseas to be prepared and to be polite. It's a good chance for you to talk and share. Take it. Mika, what advice would you give to international students about how to prepare for discussion activities? If you if you want to improve your English abilities, it takes some time. You must be realistic. You cannot make a quick improvement easily, but what you can do immediately is to have enough knowledge on that subject. If you have enough knowledge, for example, if you know technical terms, you can. There is a much higher probability that you will understand the content of the seminar. You can also help yourself by using your English outside seminars. If you make some friends from your seminar groups. You will also find that they like to discuss、uh, discuss topics with you in the seminars, so that's the advice I would give. I agree with Martina about being prepared before the discussion. I find that English students are very interested in how things are done or tackled in other countries. However, they can be impatient if you take too long to express yourself. Well, thank you very much. I hope that's given you a few ideas. Now there is something else I can suggest. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear a lecture about some useful information when you go to study overseas. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Hello, everybody, and thank you for coming. I know that you're all very busy at this time, but I hope that by coming to this talk, you'll at least get some useful information for when you go to study overseas. Well, today I want to talk about the effect of cultural background on learning style. That is, how a learner's culture might impact on his or her approach to study. 
I want to begin by looking at some basic cultural values and how these affect teaching and learning. I'll then go on to present evidence which shows that approaches to learning which are acceptable in one culture may not be acceptable in another. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them at the end of the talk. Now, I want to start by introducing the two concepts. They are actually contrasting concepts. These are conserving and extending cultures. What do these terms mean? Experts have categorized cultures as being either basically conserving or extending in their attitude to the transmission of knowledge. Let me give you an example to try to make this clear. A good example of a conserving cultural attitude is demonstrated by most Arabic cultures. Here there is the requirement to learn the holy book, the Quran, by heart. This demands a huge effort of memorization, as you can imagine. The way the Quran is learnt impacts on the way other subjects are learnt generally. It might also have an effect on learners' perception of what constitutes an acceptable teaching style. By this I mean that the unquestioning acceptance of the messages in the Quran and the concentration and repetition necessary to memorize those messages are transferred to the learning of school subjects and to the expectations students have on teachers. That's Arab culture. Let's turn now to Chinese culture. There is evidence to suggest that Chinese culture is conserving in nature. For example, keeping quiet in the classroom, listening to the teacher, not talking to other students, not interacting. These tend to characterize the Chinese classroom. As a result, Chinese learners do not develop argumentation skills as quickly as their American counterparts. American students tend to be actively encouraged to question their teachers, their materials and to interact with other classmates. However, I have to say, in the interests of balance, that Chinese students tend to work with greater concentration. But this is not the point I'm trying to make. The point is that some cultures display a conserving attitude to teaching and learning, while others display a more extending attitude to learning. Now, the memorization and non-interactive styles of learning encouraged, for example, in Arab and Chinese cultures, may disadvantage learners, at least initially, when they progress from secondary school to university. Why is this? Well, it's because universities worldwide are increasingly adopting, with a few local variations, the Western requirement for students to show argumentation skills in written assignments and effective interpersonal skills in tutorials and seminars. In other words, the world model for university teaching and learning is now the Western model, the interactive model, if you like. Now, of course, students from conserving backgrounds who go on to study in an extending culture will obviously need to adapt to a different learning style to accommodate to the new conditions. This, unsurprisingly, can often prove to be a painful process. However, such learners are able to make the transition quite successfully with guidance from academic staff and a lot of determination from their own part to unlearn or dismantle the study-related approaches and strategies acquired in their own cultures. Let me give you some examples from real life to try to illuminate this issue. I've put these on slides. Now, let's look at the comments made by three Asian students who found the Western University system of teaching and learning very different from their previous experience. If you just look at the screen, I've put these comments on slides, as I said. This is what a Chinese undergraduate from Shanghai studying at an Australian university had to say. Generally, many of us are trained in a system where you don't contribute much to classroom discussions. Some students even hesitate to ask questions from lecturers. Here's what a master's student from Japan studying at an English university in London had to say. In Japanese culture and education, the emphasis on training seems to be on intuition rather than logical construction of arguments. This makes it much harder to study at my British university. Finally, let's take a look at the comments by an Indian research student studying at an American university. One problem was getting used to the American system 
where a student is expected to find out for herself or himself the requirements and facilities of the university. This contrasts with the system at home, whereby a person, generally the lecturer or supervisor, is responsible for the needs of the student. To sum up, then, there is certainly evidence to show that the cultural values of a society affect the way that society's educational institutions function and how the teaching in them is carried out. While ensuring the continuation of cultural identity and solidarity, the existence of culturally determined patterns of teaching and learning means that individual learning style, the way a learner would prefer to learn, is largely ignored in classrooms around the world. Well, that's all I want to say for the moment. I hope you'll find what I've said interesting and useful when you go overseas to study. Are there any questions? That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test, the IELTS test. You now have ten minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet.